Hey, I'm Nate Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist currently working in northern Texas, and I specialize in the archaeology of the indigenous peoples of North America, especially what we call the eastern woodlands. I've done so for more than 10 years at this point. Um, what I'm trying to do with this channel is twofold. First, archaeologists in America have historically been very bad at making the information about our country's past available to the curious public outside of the university classroom. Um, and the result is that lots of people spend a lot of time daydreaming about going on vacation and visiting, uh, say, Stonehenge or the Egyptian pyramids, not being aware that there's an even larger monument just outside of St. Louis called Monk's Mound. Second, there's a lot of general misinformation floating around about what life was like here prior to, say, 1492, and I'd like to do my best to correct that as a professional. Um, today I want to uh, look at some common misconceptions that I've noticed that the general public has about what indigenous Americans were like prior to European contact, and how we know what we do about these people. Um, first and foremost, the general impression, uh, there's a general impression when we talk about these people of the Americas that we're somehow talking about a more or less homogenous society or entity. Um, you'll often hear people talk about how the Native Americans used to do X, Y, Z, whatever. Um, this is largely because most people don't really devote a great deal of time thinking about this, and if you even take a moment to consider how large the continent is and the fact that it has been occupied for over 16,000 years conservatively, um, clearly there's a lot of diversity and variation in, uh, you know, cultural expression and identity over the course of that time period and in the various locations and environments um, that uh, the continent is composed of. Um, so whenever we talk about the subject of indigenous Americans and what their lives were like and their archaeology and their, uh, their cultures prior to European contact, we have to consider that time and place are all very important variables um, in, in this discussion. So second, uh, the popular story that was taught in pretty much every U.S. history class that I ever took growing up was that uh, natives were somehow operating on like a zero waste kind of uh, economic system. Um, the line, the quote is, they used every part of the buffalo. And this is true in a certain respect, but it's very misleading. So one of the things that I've always been most impressed with archeologically is the ingenuity of the people that I study and the application of that you know, genius on uh, the plains, for example, meant that Yes, they had all manner of clever uses for the various uh, bones and organs and tissues and uh, other elements of their staple big game, the, the bison. Um, but this doesn't mean that when a hunting party went out from the you know local encampment um, to hunt bison, that they were going to bring back that entire animal with them uh, when, when they were done uh, killing and butchering it. Um, first off, you have to consider that these animals are huge. They, they weigh tons. And prior to the reintroduction of the horse to the North American plains, the only ways you could bring back those elements, um, the, those parts of the animal, those cuts of meat, the bones, the hides, all that, you've got two options. You can either bring it back by foot or you can um, have dogs help you carry it back because the dog was the only pack animal in North America prior to the reintroduction of that of the horse. Um, you also have to consider that certain elements of the animal are not particularly useful. Um, so, for instance, the what we call the trotter, um, the, the hoofs, the, the feet. Um, there's not a whole lot of meat on it. There's not a whole lot of caloric value. Yes, you can use the, um, the toe bones to make, for example, very large fish hooks. Um, you can break open the bones and boil them out for uh, bone grease or, or marrow, but for the most part, it's not worth the extra effort to drag all that back. There are higher uh, value um, portions of meat and bone elements that uh, are going to get priority when deciding what you can afford to bring back with you and what you're going to leave behind for the coyotes. Um, 
uh, an archaeologist named Lewis Benford spent a lot of time working out the, the mathematics of um, and the pragmatics of what elements get left behind and what elements get brought along uh, back to the home base, back to the base camp. Um, and I've experienced this firsthand. There was uh, about seven years ago I worked on a site called Blackwater Draw in New Mexico and it's a large bison kill site. There are bison bones all over the, all over the place but an element that's conspicuously absent very frequently is the shoulder blade, the scapula. And what this suggests is that the sh um, shoulder meat, uh, that like back strap kind of, is being specifically targeted for butchery because it's a lot of meat, it's very little bone attached to it, and um, it's very easy to get off. So it seems like they're targeting that particular cut of meat to be brought back to the base camp, and they're leaving most of the remainder of the carcass behind. Um, so third, and kind of in a, on a related topic, there's a pervasive idea that um, indigenous North Americans were especially uh, passive in their relationship with nature and that they didn't really have much of an impact on their immediate environment. And in fact, we know that's very much not true. In fact, they had a very um, direct interaction with their environment and they uh, were actively managing and improving upon uh, the environment that they were living in. So one example is what we call silviculture. Um, they don't necessarily have at any point in the eastern woodlands um, fully domesticated fruit trees or anything like that, but they are encouraging the growth of things like uh, hickory, which have a nut that's very useful for food, um, by discouraging competing trees and competing plants. Um, also things like oaks for acorns or uh, crab apples, fruits, fruit trees, things like that. Um, and that, that occurs in uh, as early as the Archaic period, which is, you know, 5,000, um, probably the Middle Archaic about 5,000 years ago. Um, and we also have the independent invention of agriculture, the full-fledged domestication of plants um, for food by about 4,000 years ago in areas like East Tennessee. Uh, it's called the Eastern Agricultural, Agricultural Complex. Um, lastly, there's a common misconception that North Americans did not build monuments, and I've encountered this even among European archaeologist professionals um, that I've worked with uh, here and there. Um, the idea that, that monumentality does not happen in North America. The, uh, the Mayans and the Aztecs had it, but in North America it, they didn't. And that's not true. Um, in fact, there's a site in Louisiana called Watson Break that is over 5,000 years old, and it actually predates the Olmec culture that gave rise, allegedly, to that entire Mayan-Aztec um, cultural tradition that um, is, that, you know, Mesoamerica is so well known for. Um, a little over a thousand years after Watson Break was built, there was another site in kind of a similar region of Louisiana called Poverty Point. And if you want to get into uh, like solar alignments, it's got that. Um, it's also kind of a focal point for uh, cultural interaction throughout the eastern woodlands to the point that at Poverty Point in Louisiana, we have uh, copper objects from the Great Lakes being brought all the way down the river to be deposited at the site. We've got soapstone, soapstone bowls and vessels um, being brought in from the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, there are um, stone tool resources that come from uh, as far away as um, like the Carolinas or uh, Arkansas into the, uh, into the area. Um, there's also the possibility that some of the, some of the copper might have been coming from East Tennessee. Uh, and the, the, the main monument at Poverty Point is called Mount A. It's the second largest um, monument in the eastern woodlands, only after Cahokia's uh, Monk's Mound, which was built, you know, several thousand years later. Um, and Monk's Mound is larger than any of the, uh, is larger than the largest pyramid at Giza. So um, these are just kind of some of the things that I have been butting up against in just kind of the public consciousness of what goes on in North America prior to European contact. Uh, I hope you found that interesting, and uh, thank you for watching.